Uh, before I start, I thought I'd give a shout out to my great collaborator, Dr. Ronan Connolly and Dr. Michael Connolly from Ireland. Hello, Ronan and uh, Michael. And then uh, I also wanted to have a little promotion of this infographics that we produce. I hope everybody email us and ask for a copy of this. We really do it uh, with our love of science. And this infographic involves also another Connollys, which is Dr. Imelda Connolly. And I'm glad today that I don't have to talk much about CO2, but I want to focus in on very key issues of Arctic sea level, uh, Arctic sea ice history. This is really a, a work that is done uh, uh, of our own free will, so we're really truly independent scientists, independent of fundings and, and all of that. Okay. So we're going to put the uh, UN under this uh, boxing highlight. We really want to check whether what all these statements that have been said about the Arctic, the climate, and of course the sea ice, which is a key factor, uh, signature of the uh, Arctic region, the polar region, whether what has been said by the US, uh, uh, UN uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is, has any resemblance to the inconvenient truth of reality. So we'll start with that chapter from the AR5, for those who are not familiar with AR5, it's the fifth assessment report. I hope they don't produce, keep producing this. In fact, the sixth assessment is coming up. So we are going to examine what they've been said in, in, in this particular report. So I will highlight for now two simple questions or statement or claim that has been made by this report. The first thing is about Arctic sea ice and Northern Hemisphere spring snow cover have continued to decrease in extent. And they say this is very high statistical confidence. So let's look at it. First, spring snow ice disappearing from Northern Hemisphere according to IPCC AR5. So how, how good is that statement, right? Data shows 1965, since we have some satellite coverage, we can actually do a very good a documentation of Y area so we can measure these particular changes over time. Indeed, the spring Northern Hemisphere uh, uh, ice snow cover has been decreasing. But I guess the key question that I highlight down there is uh, why did they mention only spring? I hope you all know the answer, right? It's very simple. It's just because, simply because the fall snowfall has been increasing and then the winter snowfall has been increasing. Too bad that I don't have time to explain why the spring uh, snowfall is increasing. It's probably related to the increasing spring insulation uh, 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 changes over a time period due to the orbital changes of the uh, planet perturbing the, the Earth Sun. Uh, Geometrical con configuration. The second point is, why do they mention only the Arctic? Isn't that convenient? Arctic sea has been decreasing. Yes, we know it's been decreasing. Where's the data? The data is here. On the top panel, you know where polar bear live? That's why we call Arctic. It's been decreasing. But unfortunately, we all know most of us are smart enough now because we are data-based people. We look into it. It doesn't make sense to only talk about the Arctic and then don't talk about the Antarctic, right? So it is that kind of stuff that make people really don't want to trust UNIPCC. I, for one, would never trust. Ask my son, independent of me. He won't agree with this sort of statement, right? It's ridiculous. <laughs> but what happened? Remember, this is based on satellite observation, but the key context about science is always is that, okay, we have this measurement, but you know, what is the error bar and what have we seen before, that sort of stuff. But before satellite error, we really have very limited record. In this particular work that we're doing, we went through really enormous amount of work, looking into whaling logs, aerial reconnaissance, icebreaker record, you know, all this stuff, all this good stuff that at least give us a sense of reality because we truly believe in database sort of discussion before we go anywhere else. So this is the way that IPCC report would present the result. The satellite error, we, we of course highlight for you to see that this is the big difference between satellite error because the problem is that we really know that the climate changes, as uh, Don has shown very well, changes on the multi-decadal sand. You have warming, you have cooling in every 50 or 60 years or so kind of oscillation. But look at the pre-satellite era from 1900 or so to, let's say, 1970s. Kind of flat, isn't it? Plus that we know very well that from 45 to about 76 or so, there is a period of cooling that is happening in the Arctic. But how come the sea ice data is so flat? Right? But this is the official record. 
This is why we are very suspicious of this result, so we went to and checked whether it's true or not. Because science is about also verification, independent verification. Obviously, you know that we didn't come up with the same answer as them. So I'll show you later. But we know that from Arctic temperature, by the way, information on sea ice is a lot harder to collect than at least the temperature. Even though it is imperfect, but we have a good sense of Arctic temperature covering about 100, you know, 150 years or so over the Arctic. You can see that from 1900 to about 1940, you have a warming period. And then 1940 to the 70s or so, it's cooling. And then Arctic warming again. Okay? But the key question is, yeah, indeed. Even if you have the, the warming from the 70s, the Arctic sea has been decreasing. But we know that it follows a period of cooling. So where's the evidence for that? That sea ice increasing, actually. It's supposed to increase. So this is the three, three kind of major problem with pre-satellite data. The first one is actually the data sources for each region is changing over time. So for, for example, 20 and 30s, you have mostly the ship observation. From the 50 to 70, you have the really in situ, the buoy, which is really also very key in, in giving us real information. And then you have region that cover the change over time, okay? Finally, you really, the serious problem is that most of the Arctic was not observed at all. Nobody has the real data to, to look at these things. So, it's imperfect, but here's what we come up with. But we give one example now on this problem from IPCC report. Okay? On your left there is basically so-called sea ice map that is produced by the Danish group. They are very, very good in keeping record, of course. But the problem is when people are looking at this data, so we pick this example of August 1952. They actually just put the whole area white. It's as if that there is actually sea ice there. But look at the actual Cautions that nobody read, okay? The eyes was supposed, but no information is at hand. So they are only guessing. And then, ever since then, because those are the Russian sector, those are the Chukchi Sea and the East Siberian Sea, and you look at the actual data that the Russian just released the data, and we have gotten those data from those great people from St. Petersburg, and they're showing the data like that. You can see what a mismatch of information, okay? Over-exaggeration of, of the sea ice, actually, pre-satellite era showing as if that now the change would be very dramatic. So this is a new work. The paper is already accepted as in the press, so please ask us for the paper in case you want to read in more detail, so no way I can cover this in 15 or 20 minutes. This is Ronan, this is Michael. And this is the paper, don't read the abstract, just to show you that it is a work that uh, has been accepted for publication. But a very important point that I want to make, which bothers me a lot, is that this work, I'm not even supposed to do it as a scientist, okay? It's not an official work, so it's doing it under my own free time and my own volunteer. No expense uh, uh, was covered by anyone or anybody, and we just do it our own fund for, for learning about the science, okay? That's the only, that's a big point, to try to make the point that, you know, you don't really need big money to do good quality science. You don't need all these endless charades of asking for funding and all these circus about, about money, this, money, that. So for this real work, these are the steps. It's very simple, really. But the, the main point I want to point you is that for Arctic sea ice, look at the seasonality, how you define it. For summer, it's not, it's not June, July, August. It's actually July, August, and September sea ice. You have to account for the real climatology, what happened there. So you really have to be really careful. So what we did is that we divide the data into three regions. So we have the North American region and then the the Siberian, the Russian region, and then we have the European region, right? We actually use the information from temperature data. We calculate the temperature trend. We divide into three regions and four seasons, and then we get the sea ice data, the accurate sea ice data from the satellite era since 1978 or so. And then we work out the relationship between sea ice and temperature for every region. And then don't read into this. Essentially, we use the temperature, the calibration that we have for this period, and then we use the temperature to bring back from to 1900. And then, the key step is step six. We use all that is available of the sea ice information to check the, the, the mean and the variance to try to really adjust it properly with respect to what is actually known from the temperature calibrated sea ice. And then, finally, we rescale everything, okay? Please read in detail. This is a very careful work. This is the final result. So what we are able to show is that, yes, indeed, the satellite error, because we use the best data from satellite you have melting, but the period of growth from 43 to 70s is real. It's actually happening. And then you also have all this up and down, right? And then if you compare with the summer 
uh, extent of the IPCC approved result, you will see that the pre-satellite error is pretty flat. And plus that they never show the actually sea ice increasing in the 40s and the 70s, okay? And this is our summer reconstruction result. If you compare to that, I don't think it's too drastic what, what is being changed now compared to the past period. And let's look back a little, uh, another question, which is, of course, the IPCC claim. Oh, if we don't do something about this atmospheric CO2. By the way, atmospheric CO2, here it is. Uh, Arctic sea ice is continued to shrink and thin in the northern hemisphere. You know that these are all purely based on computer model. And they've really been making this sort of prophecy about Arctic sea ice disappearing. Should we, should we keep saying this? They say it will soon disappear. You have seen report from 2016. It will disappear by 2016, 2014, 2012, 2013, 2008. And then finally, our good friend Tony Heller, one of these you know, free independent maverick, independent maverick who actually also have no funding for this kind of work, he actually found this uh, report from the fake news uh, headquarter, New York Times, uh, showing you that the claim of Arctic sea ice will be gone by 1988. It's really beyond belief, you know, that we could keep believing in this sort of stuff, you know. That it's not happening, and yet we still believe that these people have any credibility of making any claims. And here's the way the IPCC wants to show you. From, let's say, the observation period, they show you, oh, this is so many models, we're producing this, and then by 20, 2100, the scenario, by the way, is very ex extreme for the rise of atmospheric carbon dioxide, because we believe that's... The pop human population by 2100 will be 12 billion people. And then the atmospheric carbon dioxide of the equivalents, if you add methane and all this stuff, will be almost 1300 parts per million, which is quite a lot. So sea ice, bye bye. But if you really want to believe in results, this result, I give you a little caution. Since we have our French uh, realist friends here, uh, this is actually a quote from Pierre Galois, which is the well-known uh, father of the atomic bomb of the French uh, uh, people. And he says that if you put garbage into a computer, nothing comes out of it but garbage. But this garbage, having passed through a very expensive machine, is somehow a noble and no one dare to criticize this. Actually, my son just taught me a trick. This is a lot, lot better to say this. IPCC want to tell you that this is a truck. This is a truck. Okay? This is not a model. Thank you, frankly. If you think, look at the computer model. This is what they produce. It's decreasing. This is our reconstruction. They basically are very flat from those periods and then saying that, oh, CO2 come along, it's going to decrease. But I truly believe that this is really, really a natural kind of variability, even including what we observed by now, 2016. There's just no way you can make that claim. Yeah, it's the CO2 that did it, right? There's a murder in the room. <laughs> and then finally, if... IPCC blames CO2, what is it that could do it? Could it be the sun? That's the question. For this, for those full disclosure, again, I just wanted to study science, okay? So in terms of solar variability, you can see. I happen to choose to use that curve from the left. And then IPCC always promoted this particular curve and never ever discussed why the other curve could be wrong or right, okay? And it's always promoting this because they just want to believe in these particular people. And I show you now, the results that we can produce with the Arctic sea ice, uh, uh, Arctic uh, surface temperature. This is the paper that has been published. The blue curve is the temperature, and then the red curve is actually the the, the solar irradiance changes over time. Okay, I think the fit is pretty good. And this paper has been peer reviewed and published. We published this just a year ago. Uh, so I hope everybody, if you have more questions, please ask me or, or Ronan and, and Michael for reading. And, but are these Arctic sea ice changes uh, really new? Okay, that's, a, that's another question that I want to answer before I finish. I'm almost done. Please don't keep flushing me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's based on a paper from Germany, a Professor Rudiger Stein. I have already contacted them. This is actually a very, very good study that just came out about, you can see, three, three weeks ago. And what they are able to do is basically collected this uh, ocean sediment by around the Chukchi Sea and East Siberian Sea region. I'm going to show only the result from Chukchi Sea. This is a very clever technique. It's actually plankton, studying plankton, and you study a very special biomarker. It's from a fat, you know, lipid form. It's, uh, it's called ice proxy 25 carbons. Okay, it's a very, very clever technique. So they can measure it. It's kind of unique, so it's very good work that's been going on. 
So despite all the problem, I think we do have some interesting work. So they produce this new paper. Currently around that area, you have basically seasonal sea ice. Seasonal sea ice just mean that you have sea ice in the, in the winter and then summer when it's warm, when it's extremely warm, it will be ice free. But is this unusual? I hope you know the punchline. For Chukchi Sea, sorry for the graph, but uh, it shows you that you basically can have three categories of sea ice. One is basically the reduced, which is actually often ice free. You can see large part of the Holocene 10,000 years ago until five, 6,000 years ago, it's always ice free. Okay? And then you have the perennial extreme, which is which of the sea ice is filled all year round. So for this region, we have never seen it. For now, we basically mostly seasonal sea ice. So you can see that the, the sea ice actually hasn't been perennial for the last 10,000 years. And it's often re reduced during the Bronze Age and, and, and earlier, right? The Bronze Age is about 3,000 BC to about uh, 500 BC or so. So, and the sea ice coverage changes over century time scale. And it seems to have relationship with solar activity as, as, as shown by Professor Stein. So I'm done now. The question is, Arctic sea ice indeed has been decreased since 1970, but the key point is simultaneously Antarctic sea ice is increasing. We really do need to answer the question instead of just saying, oh, looking at just specific evidence that we found CO2. Obviously, it's not CO2 doing that. Then, you can see that it was increasing from 1940 to 70. Can IPCC try to explain that with rising CO2? Then, you can see that IPCC's conclusion, especially those future projection another, you know, 85 years from now, is based on computer models. I mean, those things, I mean, as good as my modeling work, right? So it's not good. It's really not good work at all. And then finally, Arctic sea ice has been repeatedly advancing and retreating long ago, since before the Bronze Age. Was anybody driving SUV then? <laughs> so I also conclude that from all that I know, I look into this, I mean, it's really that like maybe related to the sun, although, you know, we don't come here to bang our chest that I'm so smart that I found the sun to be doing that. Science is continual journey of keep testing and retesting your ideas and your hypotheses and based on what the data is available. So I propose that IPCC should start taxing the sun if they don't like this idea. Thank you. <laughs>